Well, good afternoon if you are in New York City or Buenos Aires or Rio de Janeiro or Dallas. Uh, good morning if you're in Seattle or California. Good evening if you're in Stratford-upon-Avon or Paris in France and anywhere in Africa. Hello to people around the world and special love to our loved ones in Ukraine. Welcome to Fred Plotkin on Fridays on Adagio, the place where classical music happens. As you know, Adagio is a video and audio streaming platform dedicated to supporting artists and to making classical music and opera available to fans all around the world. I'm very thrilled to have today's guest. You hear me say that occasionally, but not often because I really want to underline what I am thrilled. And I am thrilled to have Stephen Wadsworth here today. He's someone we've known each other because we live on Planet Opera, but we don't see each other that often. We've not really had a chance to converse. And he's someone I've always wanted to ask a lot of questions to and learn from because I learned a lot more from his work than almost anyone else working in the opera business. Hmm. And because we've never spoken about this, Stephen, you don't know that, but it's true. Uh, it's been a learning curve for me for 40 years watching what you do. And so, number one, welcome. You're in Stratford upon Avon in the United Kingdom, but you basically live in New York, yeah. from what I know. Um, and the first question I want to ask you, Stephen, is something that I think unites almost all the work of yours that I've seen. And I should say that you are perhaps best known as a director of opera and of theater, um, but you were also a translator, a fantastic teacher from what I know because I talk to your students. I've seen your work at the Juilliard School. I've seen your work at the Met Lindemann Young Artists Program. Um, I've seen productions of yours in Seattle, in California, in New York City, in the UK. Uh, I've never been to Houston, so I've not seen them there. I've never been to Columbus, Ohio, so I've not seen them there. But most places, if there's a Stephen Wadsworth production going on, I tend to buy a ticket only because of your name, not if it's Handel or Mozart or, or Monteverdi, and not, it doesn't matter the company. If Stephen Wadsworth has worked on it, the McCarter Theater in Princeton, New Jersey is another example. Um, I'll go just based on that, and I'll tell you my conception of your work, and maybe this is your approach to work, um, because it's a very elusive thing. I think that Stephen Wad's work has fantastic taste, and I count on that. Taste doesn't mean behaving well. Taste doesn't mean... Um, being prim or whatever. It means understand, I think understanding what works, what's meaningful, what strikes visual and emotional chords. That's my definition, Stephen. What is your definition of taste? Well, I don't know. I mean, I suppose there's taste in the sense of what one likes over something else, very subjectively. There's, you know, someone has good taste. Aesthetically, someone has good taste in people <laughs> you can go a lot of ways with that but um i'm glad you think i have good taste uh, even though we're we're not entirely sure what taste is uh, your um definition is grand um and i'm i'm glad that you've uh that you uh, think of my work in that way um i am really i do sort of consider myself a a, a servant of the piece, a servant of the actors, a servant of the audience, in and of you know, I want, I want it to be clear, and I do happen to love. I think it's my responsibility to learn to love the uh, the aesthetic of the piece itself. Not that I have any problems with in theory, with um, uh, importing a different aesthetic or transporting the piece into a time other than its original place at all. And I'm doing it now on a project, in fact, um, and have done many times through the years. Um, <clears throat> but yeah, that business of, of trying to be in sync with the work and to be 
you know, clarity is my mantra um, in in directing. Uh, well, in everything, I suppose, um, and with a, with a particular um, concern always and excitement about um, relationships between people among people. Um, and in the telling of story of each person, and at the same time, the telling of the story of each relationship, and the telling of the story, whatever it is, you know, in a way that's um, that's uh, inevitably going to be fresh if you attend to those things. I don't know. I mean, I sometimes look at my work and I don't think it's fresh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm going to go but, further with this you know. because. Not too long ago it was Bastille Day, and it gave me a chance to revisit the notion of France and so forth. Um, you know that I'm very well known for my work regarding everything Italian, and therefore people think that I must have an Italian focus only and not anything else, and that's just not true. I happen to have a great passion for what the French call reason. and when you go to France, there is a logic that seems to work very well, at least for French people. And sometimes it runs counter to the logic of Italians or English speakers or Asians or Africans or whatever. But they even had their own Internet for a long time. Um, they had everything sort of with a French model and a French twist. Um, uh, somehow, and I went to school in France, and I people think of me for Italy, but I'm deeply rooted in French culture. Um, they, their concept of reason and rationality is much more in sync with who I am than anything Italian. Italian is about passion for culture, for experimentation, for adaptation, for improvisation, things based on intellectual gifts and natural um natural presence of of food wine drink voices whatever materials yeah. land soil i mean i think of it as a, as a very as humanism i mean the renaissance was the was the run up to the enlightenment it was the yeah. the last awakening before the enlightenment of the you know set late 17th and um, early 18th century and that is the reason and rationality and the rational thinking is what really put our country oh irony <laughs> on the map um, originally as an entity um, I think that's one reason that I have always been um, particularly interested in the age of reason and in works of art that uh, reflect it, or that um, more that 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 address themselves to the essence of the age, the sense of impending change and um, the cost of change, um, and that also lines up very much with the way I think about people and life. You know. Um, so yeah, I handle and uh, the French playwright Marivaux, uh, who were writing at the same time, um, handle in London and Marivaux in Paris, in the 1720s, 30s. Um, those have been my. That's sort of where my my summer house is. <laughs> so yeah. like um, I mean, Paul, right. you mentioned something I was going to address that you and I as Americans. We're in very few who seem to recognize that much of the foundation of our um, approach to our constitution, to our sense of liberty and so on, comes not from the British, but from the French. And certainly Italy influenced Thomas Jefferson, and, and there there is that too, but it really is France. Yeah. And the first American consulate, even before we had embassies, because we're not yet a nation, was in Bordeaux. and. So therefore, this relationship is very intense, very deep. And I always feel there's a misunderstanding, there's a love but misunderstanding between the Americans and the French. That yeah, I think, I mean, 
there's there are a lot of politicians at the moment who really are pretty unfamiliar with the history of revolutionary America. Um, and when we had some years ago, you know, everybody can, uh, talking about French fries being bad and, you know, the French, I don't know, it's so ludicrous um, because yes, we, we inhaled via Tom Paine and Ben Franklin and others, um, huge, important essences of, the, of rational thinking, which enabled Europeans in the late 17th century to begin to separate, um, the, you know, tr truth in thinking and processes and science from the church. Um, and really to say, well, you know, if a, if a bonsai tree is, is actually the same species as a giant redwood, um, they're awfully different looking. Yep. You'd never know they were both trees. Uh, perhaps, perhaps all humans are in fact inherently, um, uh, uh, you know, we're the same species. We're the same genus. We're not a bunch of different ones. Um, and therefore, shouldn't the rules in economy and so um, all these uh, areas of life be equally affordable for all human beings? And um, uh, mind you, I mean, another irony, we have, we have this great burgeoning of of rationalist thinking in the in the century that was also the the all time winner for the slave trade um, in terms of amount of, of trading that was going on, um, and that's you know so equality as they were able to define it then was a visionary thing, and yet it was also a blind thing in some respects as well. But and that's also baked into um our country unfortunately it was uh, white males with money and privilege which yeah. is to say it was not even all white males and just as an aside spain and france in addition to britain and the united states were very involved in the slave trade so was portugal and everything was in them. europe i mean we're, everyone's implicated here it's yeah. not there's no there's no out uh, america has a further problem which is that um black labor built the infrastructure of this country yep. and to some degree uh, with the assistance or you know colleague or the colleague asian colleagues who were similarly uh, treated and put to work and uh, without um for the most part without any compensation yeah um so in which i would add italians only in the period after uh the emancipation in in 1863 because suddenly italians took over the labors that black people used to be forced to do and especially in places like louisiana not only but especially in louisiana anyway i want to stick to stephen wadsworth for now yeah, well, that's fine. Um, i mean we we might wander again but yeah Whatever. That's okay. But I, I think, I mean, now that we've defined it briefly, I think that part of where I connect to your work, not just the things you choose to direct or stage or translate, but the ideas inherent within them, the way you present them to the audience, is this, let's call it the French connection, for lack of a better, more original term. Um, because Clarity is something you emphasized, but I think also I'm intrigued by the fact that although we've been talking about revolution, most of your work is anchored in the period before, in the centuries, couple of centuries before that led up to that. And maybe it was the intellectual and, and social processes that happened in those years that led to revolution. Are you more interested perhaps in, in the evolution than the revolution? Um, I'm interested in both. And, you know, I, I did about um, what's going on 10 years ago. Now I translated the three Figaro plays, mm -hmm. um, Beaumarchais, 
which were you know 1770s, 80s, and 90s in that order. Um, and when they came out, Barber, Figaro, and then the Guilty Mother. Um, so I, I wouldn't say that revolutionary France or the revolutionary moment or the, the fact of the revolution and what it represented to Europe after centuries of um, dark, darker times um, wasn't as interesting to me as anything else. But I, I, I did land in the 1720s and 30s, I think first through a kind of aesthetic attraction. I just, when I was a kid, I, in the 60s, I would, I remember being obsessed to hear the Handel operas and to hear the next one. And I couldn't possibly explain to you, and I was well into my career before I could even explain to myself what, you know, or sort of uh, parse intellectually what that was, what that meant. Um, But I was, but Handel was the was the one Handel just spoke my mind he spoke my heart and the music is so and to this day if I need to um, feel a little better I just you know on there 17,000 units of (laughs) of Handel opera that I can go to on my Rolodex and just um, hear uh, either on my handy dandy Idajo or um, in my head, if necessary, or I can hum them or sing them or whatever. So that that drew me. And then I remember when um, when I first heard the word Marivaux, and I thought I had a strange response to it. I said, "That's that's for me. That's that's mine." Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was that was in the early. Well, I guess it was probably in the mid seventies at some point that I heard it, but I didn't see a play by Marivaux until the eighties. I was in Berlin, and I saw Luc Bondy's production of a *Triumph der Liebe*, *The Triumph of Love*, mm-hmm. which was a, a, a brilliant, wonderful, amazing evening in the theater, but very dark. And I just had the feeling that it wasn't. It wasn't on the nose. And I really didn't know anything about Marivaux. Well, as it happens, Marivaux wrote all those great plays for a troupe of Italian players who all but one spoke French with heavy Italian accents. Um, and they were they were a, a, a basically a sort of glorified commedia troupe which had graduated because of circumstances to performing scripted plays um, when they were finally allowed to return to Paris in the early 1720s. Um, So, you know, that stuff made sense to me. And then I realized, hey, this is exactly when Handel's over there. Now, there couldn't be more different in some respects, except that if you look at the libretto of any opera seria, um, particularly the way they were sort of honed and focused in the 18th century, you basically have story of a ruler who starts the play with a with too much appetite for something, who is um, greedy or run by emotion rather than reason, and that through a series of events, usually in the arena of love, learns how to be a more responsible person and therefore it is implied and hoped a more responsible ruler um and seeing as we were looking at all monarchs then and the democracy was not a a fact um that that formula made a lot of sense to me just personally it was a journey that i had to I had to make. I had to come out of a world of emotion run amok and figure out a way to become a coherent individual. Um, so they spoke to me. Um, and I think that the Marivaux plays are all the same thing. They're, you know, and they often involve a prince or a noble per a nobleman. They um they show a very what was at the time, I think, a really um, 
tantalizing but um, risque uh, blending of lower class and upper class worlds, a real pressing together of um, like those great Vato uh, paintings and drawings of comedians in the garden with ladies. The, and the, I was uh, going to go right there. Should we go to Vato right now? Sure. Okay, so um, because we haven't spoken, you may not know this about me. When I teach music or opera to people who are not necessarily in the field but are open to it, but may feel that they can't comprehend the abstraction of music, but connect to the more tangible visual arts mm -hmm. i use visual artists to teach composers so that i use beethoven for michelangelo i use mozart for Raphael. i use leonardo da vinci i use bach i use delacroix for berlioz and so on and so forth um it's very generic but i have found that sometimes if they like michelangelo they like beethoven and so forth i like it and so oh. when I discovered that you did a lecture at Princeton a number of years ago about Vato and and um, Marivo, would you talk about how you had that idea and what is inherent in these connections you find between Vato and Marivo? Well, those Vato images of the um, of the 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 nighttime garden um, with ladies of station. Um, mix mingling and sort of suggestive groupings with actors. Now, this is not a time when actors were considered to be respectable in any way, shape, or form. The Italian actors were particularly sort of, I mean, they got kicked out of France at the end of the uh, 17th century because they were were so um, subversive in in their in their parody, they would perform in Italian, gesture in the language everyone could speak, and they would say all sorts of appalling things about all sorts of important people, and 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 finally, crucially, about Madame de Maintenon, who was the second major mistress of Louis the Fourteenth, and a kind of a buttoned-up gal who managed to button up Louis um, fairly conclusively by the end of his life and um they did a, a this particular troupe did a little play about madame de maintenon being this prude um foolish prude and which and then they were asked to leave the country um the, when louis died and the and the regent the duke of orleans took over uh, for the for you know the first part of the reign of the next Louis, um, he he was a a fun loving guy, and he immediately called up the Italians. I was like, get back up here, <laughs> and that's when it only took a, a year or so for Marivo to to gravitate towards the Italians. And it's so interesting because Marivo, if you speak with uh, you know a French writer or intellectual. Marivaux is the most French thing in the whole world. In fact, it's untranslatable. It's in, it's impossible to, to convey the subtlety and sophistication and suggestiveness of his language was always the, the thing. And when I started to work on translating those plays, everybody was like, it can't be done. Well, French friends of mine were like, no, yeah. it's not possible. And I remember going to the Alliance Francaise and doing a a talk with a bunch of other people, including the head of the of the Comédie Française at that time, a director, and we were asked to speak about a, a certain a certain aspect of Marimbo's work. And I talked about his relationship with the Italians, and those guys were so upset <laughs> because it was not a sort of acknowledged part of the French scholarship academe on uh, on Marivo. it was um and they i remember when i said um you know i quoted a, a famous letter from a, a a woman who wrote after the premiere of the dublin constance a, um, a play that i translated using the title Chan changes of heart mm -hmm. 
um, where she describes the Harlequin taking the mask off in the performance and how touching it was to see the, the face of the real actor underneath after spending an evening with this fantastical creature who was a sort of gallicized Arlecchino, um, but uh, elegant and funny, but also foul mouthed um, one. Um, and I talked about that and, the, and I, I remember uh, Monsieur Michel said to me afterwards, he said, mm, c'est discutable. That's debatable. <laughs> and I was like, no, it's not debatable. It's right in every <laughs> Marivaux book that you guys all went to school with, right? Um, but in the part that isn't the play, you know, the history. Of it. <laughs> anyway, um, it's a fascinating uh, period. And it does hook in a, in a, the roots of it in me are both personal from my own family situation, but they're also about me as an American person, um, an American sensibility. And I've always been um, really interested in, in bringing and in, in sort of perceiving uh, European artists for Americans, as it were, curating them or presenting them in a way that that Americans really could understand and could get a sense of the um, of the flavor and the subtlety, uh, not only of, of language but of, of of theatrical style, you know, all of it. it all that stuff fascinates me. You know, style. Um, that's my that turns me on more than anything else in the world. I just I, I hear you, and I want to go there a little bit more, but I first want to ask a very broad question. That's a very narrow question morals and mores that may be embedded in an ancient Greek play or French comedy or French tragedy or Italian commedia dell'arte or British restoration comedy and so on and so forth that may be products of a culture and a language, are they translatable into other cultures, in our case, Americans, but it could be Japanese, it could be anything? Yeah, I mean, well, you know, look at we we have certain elements of all these cultures which are acknowledged to be universal, at least as expressed by great artists, right? So we have no theater, and we have um, we've got Shakespeare, and we have um, uh, you know Tennessee Williams, and we have Marivaux and and Beaumarchais, and we have Racine and Corneille and Mon Moliere, and you know, they all are, and we have Euripides, we have the fifth century BC in Athens with, with uh, those three incredible playwrights and probably more Euripides, Aes Aeschylus initially, Euripides, Sophocles. Um, and they all, if, if, you, if you make it your business to really get into the nitty gritty of how they wrote, how they were using language, how they thought about language, how they presented language to the actor, um, and what that said about their their um, feelings about life and uh, politics and uh, and the formation of city states in a sort of democratic ish mold, right? The Renaissance was a rebirthing of that long ago time in ancient Greece when there was some kind of blooming of uh, 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 and, and purity of thinking about, about a social ideal that we maybe particularly recognize as um, democracy lovers. Mm -hmm. um, but it is the beginning of uh, the, the beginning of traceable, um, a culture that that we're happy to claim as our as our uh, inspiration, um, but I think all these they're all different, and everything that's every artist that's great um, is going to be translated and is going to work on some level. If you can make Marivo work linguistically, it's extra special. Um, if you can make an audience understand um, why Moliere, you know, what, what, what the rhymed couplet K 
can do, especially for an audience that had been watching Racine's uh, uh, serious plays be performed in rhymed couplets, right? Um, we hear rhymed couplets and it's sort of automatically funny in American literature. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm now I'm working on a translation of Fed, of Racine, which is like trying to translate Hamlet. It's kind of dumb, but I started it a few years ago and it's something I felt I just needed at that time to address something that was huge and um, uh, sort of unfathomably um, urgent and um, just about, about an unsolvable problem um, and something ravishing at the same time. Um, so I'm going to pause you there, Stephen, not because you're not saying things that are to me are catnip, but because you're anticipating questions that I really wanted to ask you. And no, you're great. Please do, do not cover your mouth. Um, the first one is um, we were talking about verse and rhyme and couplets. I happen to be a great lover of Moliere. He is arguably my favorite playwright. And um, I grew up before I could read the French. I grew up on the Richard Wilbur translations, which tended to really try to emphasize the linguistic cadences and humor and inner rhymes of the original French. Um, to what degree should that be a virtue when we hear it in, in English or another language? Or should that be um, something left for the French to admire? Oh, no, I, I mean, uh, I think that we have to do whatever we can. If if we are the wordsmith in question, I would just urge anybody who's working to really to try to work on the terms of the of the artist and the playwright. I mean, right now with Racine, I'm committed to I'm for one thing staying with Alexandrites and now the famous translations um, of Racine into English are Wilbur and uh, Robert Lowell and they're both in first of all in iambic pentameter and the, second of all there's a lot of slant rhyme they don't stick uh, uh, you know, strictly to it. Well, Lowell wrote a, a very powerful script, and I've taught that parts of that script before, and I I have a lot of esteem for it, but I also don't think it, I think it fundamentally doesn't resemble uh, the Phaedra that Racine wrote, because it doesn't capture what the Alexandrine, which has that extra iamb and then it's iambic hexameter at six feet rather than pentameter and they both write in their forwards oh well you know pentameter is the only way americans or english people hear well shakespeare taught us how to hear pentameter and we enjoy it and it makes a lot of sense but hexameter is only right i mean more huh. yeah. i just don't buy that at all so i think it is in theory possible to to really translate on the on the model of the original as much as possible, and also to be one gains as much freedom as one does through just sort of saying, oh, I'm not going to do it in poetry. I mean, it's verse. And part of the greatness of it is that it of those Moliere plays, especially as they turn darker, um, is the is the fact that they're so delicious with all that essentially sort of silly rhyming which has both which has satirical um implications it has character it has um there's just wonderful satire and uh, social criticism and also uh, character painting in the way that he uses them. So, I mean, to me, it's style is content, yeah. right? So those elements of style that are easy to say, oh, I'm gonna jettison this because it's the essence of the play we want. And did Robert Lowell get the power of Fedra, the sort of power of it, the gut power? Yeah, he did. So, you know, it's a success on that level, but he did it, in aesthetically in a way that is so very different from 
from Racine and the way Racine was hearing um, and the way he expected words to come out of a mouth on a stage that I think we lose uh, something in that translation. So, you know, my attempt, I mean, I'm no Robert Lowell, but I'm I'm willing to go in there. I, I was offered a, a chance to do this like 30 years ago. And I said to the um, person who was suggesting this commission, I said, are you out of your mind? I said, that's like translating Hamlet. I can't, I couldn't possibly do that. I don't have the, I have a kind of intimate relationship with the French language without ever having lived there and, and therefore not being fluent in the language as a speaker. It's sort of like having a French lover for a long, 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 long time, but never really having much of a coherent conversation with the person. Um, that's the way I feel about, about French language. It's there some some of it jumps off the page at me in a way that is so familiar or and so visceral that, you know, I I trust that. My only issue with French lovers is the bad coffee. <laughs> you know, coffee is, if you, my theory about coffee is if you live there or if you stay there for more than a month, you can deal with it. But that may be because uh -oh. I'm desperate to need coffee. <laughs> I need coffee so badly that I'm willing to overlook, you know, um, coffee problems. Steve, my next question is, a, again, a huge question but something that I think about and grapple with a lot, and I've not asked anyone about it, so you get it. Um, I've really come to believe that in what we call arts and entertainment, because they often go together, um, that we in modern life in our arts and entertainment have not carved space for tragedy. And when I see, when I attend tragedies by Racine, by the Greeks, by Verdi, by certain other great theater artists where you can feel the tragic, Shakespeare as well. Um, there are works such as La Tragedie de Carmen, about Carmen, is referred to as the tragedy of Carmen. Um, only recently, there was one film probably about 15 years ago now called Dancer in the Dark with Bjork and Catherine Deneuve that hit genuine tragedy for me. Mm -hmm. number one if you agree with me do you think that we have not made room in our modern life we don't want it in our theater in, in our arts i don't think that's true but i okay. think in america particularly there's a um in the last sort of well, since about 1980 i think there's this whole thing about life should be i remember reagan in a in a debate with carter saying Life should be easy for people. It shouldn't be a slog. You, everything, you should be able to get anything you want. We're Americans after all. Well, I think that there is, you know, the classic thing, you ask an American how they are and they say, oh, I'm fine. Um, and then you say, how are you really? And they start to cry, you know, or whatever. You get the real story. We are, are it has become, I think, a reflexive, uh, a reflex to, to, to smile and make everything seem like it's just fine. And I think that's not, you know, an audience for, that's not a potential audience for tragedy. On the other hand, um, there's not that great an audience for theater um, in the, in this country, although, you know, it's been shown that if theater is taken around, that people are, in different contexts socially are extremely responsive to it how can they not be it's it, it speaks in archetypes and and sometimes those archetypes are tragic and sometimes they are they make you laugh sometimes they are more entertaining than they are edifying you know in the sort of noblest sense of that word in the way that tragedy was meant to you know, but tragedy was really, the idea was that you went in there and you yourself were drawn to a place of, of, of emotional release, a catharsis, which left you um, purified 
in some way, which which helped you emotionally. <laughs> but yeah. you know, you can't you can't just get there with a bunch of laughs necessarily. My favorite thing in the world is, you know, my favorite four words in the English language are, you know, something a person says after seeing a piece of theater, I laughed, I cried. <laughs> because it's everything. And there and the Marivo plays can be uh, incredibly moving yeah. at times. And they're also incredibly funny and witty and just so sublimely clever they can you can get stuck in a little cloud of of wonderment at something so touching and beautiful and also so funny at the same time what's what's more wonderful than that but i think people do have a need and a taste for tragedy i just think that we have a cultural reflex right now which is very i'm fine which sanitizes it. I, I, you express something I feel that when I attend a tragedy, when I experience a tragedy, either in the arts or when sometimes in the world, when we see a you know a tsunami or you name the tragedy, the war in Ukraine right now, yeah, I, I'm horrified as a human, but individually I feel grateful because I recognize that there, but for you know god go i and that we are all vulnerable to this and you live more consciously more mindfully more with more gratitude if you, understand. you say it beautifully it's that's exactly what the the point of that i think is you know we did um i'm thinking i'm remembering i was reading about it today the an opera called amelia written by darren hagen with a libretto by gardner mcfall and i wrote the story which is to say i helped the two of them uh turn their ideas into a story form um and we did this in seattle some years ago and it, there's it's really about a it's about a woman reckoning with her the loss of her father who happened to be a flyer um during the vietnam war um at the at the same time that she's coming to term with her pregnancy and she has a lot of trouble pulling it all together in those last moments um or those last days and one scene is a flashback to vietnam where we where the family her mom and her get a letter from a north vietnamese couple saying we know about your father and that they haven't ever heard anything he was just missing in action and then presumed dead um and so they go in the opera they go to the town and they meet these people and they have a an interpreter and the the couple tells them the story of what happened and it's enacted around them as they tell it um and it it involves the you know a point black execution of a child by the village commando who happens to have been the child of the couple who happened to be the people who took their father in when he was wounded so and the father was taken away so the 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 end of the story isn't a particularly good one but the but the women get this information and it it ends up being powerfully useful to them well after this we had so many vets um of various wars at that 2010 performance notably of course vietnam um and the response of course those guys were just undone by this to revisit this and to um to see a tragic experience of their own lives turned into a a a story that could edify people and and elicit from people the same kind of terror and pity that they had experienced during the war um one guy said i i i don't i didn't feel alone tonight 
And it was the first time in a long time, right? So that that their experience was being shared. I think that's there was so many, so much variety of response from them. And there was, and of course, it was a moving evening. It was there was parts of it that were so touching. And so that, you know, that speaks to how tragedy can hook into an American life. I mean, none of those guys is going out probably looking for a you know, a, a reason to cry and get upset, um, especially considering how often they can be, how easily people have been in battle can be triggered. Uh, and I should say battle of different kinds, not yeah. just wars. Um, but, you know, yes, we need it and we crave it, I believe, um especially or even and maybe especially as as we say i'm fine you know yep. we don't want to be always pretending everything's okay we want to be able to tell the truth everybody does everybody does i want to ask you about an artist whose work i admired hugely i met her once i can't say that i knew her much at all you worked with her. I discovered you wrote an article about her for Opera News, Lorraine Hunt Liebers in a mezzo soprano, who certainly was able to touch tragedy in her performances, who died at the age of 52 of cancer. She fought cancer for a long time. She would use Bach cantatas as an exploration of illness and mortality, and really, as we say in American English, went there emotionally. Um, in whatever she did, but not in an overwrought operatic way. No. Would she you talk, talk about anything telling the you truth. want to say about her and her artistry and, and her her specialness? Every person I know who ever worked with her said it was one of the great experiences. It was for me too. I mean, I I as we first did, I met her, I met her when she was doing um I had friends who were singing in in Peter Sellers uh, Mozart. A cycle at SUNY Purchase in the mid '80s, and I met her at that time. And then um, I asked if we could hear her and hopefully hire her for Carabino at Opera Theater of St. Louis. That was probably '87 or '88 or '90, maybe I can't remember somewhere in that area. And then we the next year she did uh, Sesto in Clemenza di Tito in Houston. Uh, which we then were able to do later at City Opera. Which uh, is where I saw it, New York City Opera. Yeah, yeah. and I did Ashoka's Dream with her, um, which is how she met her husband, Peter Lieberson. Sure. Yeah. Um, he was determined that that role <laughs> was for a soprano. And I said, no, it's not. And he said, well, what are you talking about? I'm the composer. And I said, it's not because I know who's going to sing it. And she's a mezzo. And he was like, really annoyed and I said I'll send you a tape and he called up he was just who is this um and that is you know that's what the Lorraine feeling is and I had I had the fortune in the Figaro time to have a lot of laughs with her as well which uh, she said it had been a long time that she had such a fun time with uh, on a project or just really at all and um so we bonded on different levels and we remained friends and she actually sang in our wedding mm. um i you know I, I don't know what to say she was a she was someone that i i loved very dearly and um uh, someone whom i miss um very regularly and someone whose work i mean to be near her working i remember you know there were always people in the room who were terrified of her because she when she did go there in your words she <laughs> she would get kind of stuck between the world of the character and and the lorraine world which was not a simple world mm -hmm. and um so she was extremely open and and you know when she would get something wrong or somebody would uh, would be in the wrong place and, and she would be liable to say what, what what are you doing there and they would 
you know, that's sort of against the rules of engagement. Um, but she would get so intense and, and everybody, of course, realized that, um, that she didn't do anything at any time that wasn't fully considered. And I think she's, she's really our cause, you know, not yeah. just the similarity of them both dying in their early fifties, but, um, but the fact that she, she, as a musician, as a vocalist, as an actor, she was completely um, skilled and articulate and um, and impassioned to the to a degree that you know and and unfailingly so. So it wasn't like you went to a performance and she did really well in an aria. Yep. It was that the whole thing was great. And she didn't work that much. She said no to most things because you couldn't be Lorraine and perform at that intensity level and remain alive unless you had a lot of time to yourself um because i have to be mindful of time today i just want to tell listeners that Stephen will be directing la clemenza di tito at juilliard in the spring of 2024 regular listeners know it's near the very top of my favorite of all operas certainly my favorite mozart opera um his production was one of my favorites, along with that of Jean Pierre Ponel, and who I know you studied and have been influenced by. We're going to have to leave that for another time because the next <laughs> thing I want to ask you about, Stephen, and maybe we'll just have to do a series with you, is one of the things that I love about your work is the set design. And I don't think you necessarily do the set design, but clearly your conception as the director producer. Um, influences the set design and inevitably I cannot think of a Stephen Wadsworth production I've seen where I didn't like the set mm -hmm. and I can think of so many productions where I hated the set and I felt it were counter to um, to what the opera is about I will name two you can pick any you want uh, both were at the Met Rodolinda and if you should to read Right. Well, they're both designed by Thomas Lynch, who was a great, great designer. And I work, he, I had a regular team for, for the Marivaux and the, and the ring and, and then a couple of the Met shows, which was um, Tom Lynch as for the set and uh, Mark Pacladinas, the late uh, costumes and Kandorowski yeah. did lighting. Yeah. Um, so Rodolinda was those three. And then, uh, Neil Jampolis ended up doing the lighting for uh, Evigenie, but it was Marty and Tom. And uh, so I think, you know, these designers, I have to say, the people that I learned as a, a director starting out that I learned from were the most were Tom Lynch and Dunya Ramikova, costume designer, um, who I worked with quite a lot. In fact, she did the Tito, um, which we ended up doing in New York. Um, and those, these are these were great people of incredible uh, culture and artistic talent, but also the best read people ever, and the most, um, uh, you know, sort of humane, uh, thoughtful, open uh, minds you can imagine and they i just i just you know it was it's playing tennis with people who were better than you and i'm very lucky that i figured that out right from the get-go i didn't start directing till i was 29 so i had a little bit of mileage and a little bit of thinking under me and i i the the greatest blessing was in those uh people that i came to work with regularly in any case with Tom, I would often <laughs> arrive with a drawing, which, and I'm not, I'm no artist. Um, so every angles were skewed and things were crazy. Um, but I would say, I need this space here. And then there's a sort of liminal space there. And then I want to divide this and I need a level. And I think it wants to feel, da -da -da. I have a very, very keen sense of the body in space. Um, I would say, weirdly, that that choreographic element is the most um, 
a stirring thing emotionally in the room for me. It's sometimes just unbearably uh, emotional, just setting people up at, at certain angles that tell story, <laughs> that tell, give you detail about relationship and intimacy and the degree to which it is made or you know it, it is happening or not happening um those so space how it works what's in it how things work aesthetically and i spent my life i was lucky enough to have parents who got me to looking at buildings and music, paintings and and reading and just getting a really broad sense of of what was out there um in terms of western art i have to say i'm a i'm a i'm of almost entirely european stock i have a little bit of egyptian copped in me very little bit um and depending on what month it is or what year it is 23 and me having put all the data together and come up with a different thing will announce that I have a little Ashkenazi or I have little this or a little Pacific Islander. Anyway, those <laughs> things tend to come and go, but Egyptian cop, fine. That's like part of a percent, but the rest of it is French, which I didn't know until fairly recently. French, German, English, um, you know, Southern France, Northern Italy, and some Scandinavian, a Danish and and well, and Finnish, which is not Scandinavia strictly. But so, you know, who knows what that is? I feel very connected to my cultural heritage. Um, and I thank my parents for for that, uh, making that connection for me and with me um, and encouraging it just so much i went to the to see don giovanni at the old mat i was five years old i loved it i couldn't stop talking about it in the car berman version mm -hmm. the, the berman production yeah the berman production yeah okay just maybe the season or maybe i think the the season it was 58 59 so it was the season yep. after it was new yep and it had those people cesare sieppi eleanor yeah. steeper eleanor yep. steeper um lisa Del that's something else uh, you and i have in common my first opera starred eleanor stever uh -huh. but, but i want to get back to the set design because i i want to I, there's so, so much tom tom could take what i brought him and and was in, in no way threatened by it he was he delighted in it he he wanted to help me work on that and we would discuss the degree to which it be it should be aestheticized and how it's you know, the Tito production or the Iphigenie production are so um, inspired by, well, David is an important painter there in yeah. that period. Um, and particularly the, the staging of the principles and the way Dunya costumed them and the way I grouped them. Um, if that all sounds very from the outside in and very, you know, styly no. no, no. but but for me it is the same thing as the um crazy throbbing heart of that opera it is not different the way in which a thing is told isn't different from what it is it mm -hmm. enhances um in every, if you get every element of production uh, working for you in the way that you approach the piece and the way you tell the story. What a fantastic, you really can take the audience and drag them through the evening and maybe even deliver them a catharsis or bring them to a moment of breathless wonderment. You know, just... I had the opportunity to work a lot with Franco Zeffirelli. I studied with him first in Italy and then worked with him in Italy and then New York. And thrilling inspiring but exasperating too because his production people miss his tosca from 1985 they did at the met with barons and domingo it it was exciting she was very exciting domingo was great but um the set design for me was very beautiful to look at but you couldn't have crowd movement in the first act in the, in the church scene and in the second act there was so much decor you could not create tension between Scarpia and Tosca because it was too much in the way that Barons had to navigate, and yeah. she was a magnificent actress. 
Yeah, there, there's also, I mean, one of the wonderful things about Zeffirelli is that pictorially he uses the, he actually uses the scale of the Met yeah. and he grew up in an opera house and so did I. So we, yeah. you know, I'm used to do, to dealing with big scale. Um, but my biggest concern going into the Met is to scale it off the people so mm -hmm. that they are what we're looking at. And Zeffirelli, uh, I have to say the 1964 Falstaff Work. was the first thing at the Met to my knowledge, that could be called a truly integrated production. Mm -hmm. Then he was, he had been working with Visconti and he really he renewed that opera. He had worked on it in Vienna with, with him. He came right to the Met. He made it happen. He stayed on the actors. He created an ensemble and the acting was wonderful. And it was the first time I'd seen that in opera since the Corsaro productions, which were beginning to happen at roughly the same time. I mean, you no, know, I felt he, I mean, really Cavalier Rusticana, the, yeah, huh? Cavalier Rusticana was big, but perfect. I felt I've been already on this, that he did a terrific Don Giovanni at the Met, which was more to scale. But um, I'm comparing it now with Ponell, whose Clemenza and Idomeneo were based on Piranesi drawings and design. And oh, I'll tell you something, you know, yeah. I, I listened to you with Suzanne Menzer, who was a graduate of, yeah. of the Ponell e Domineo. Um, and at the Met, I find those that production, well, Tito, mm -hmm. particularly Tito, because of that one I saw in the early 70s, in, and that was created for the Cuvillier Theater in Munich, which is Munich, a yeah. little Baroque theater. And it was the same idea, but it was so intimate. So you, it, and it, you know, with Brigitte Fassbender and Julia Faradi and these, Werner Hallweg, I mean, powerful voices and powerful personalities in a very small space. It was, it was incredibly thrilling. So as that production got bigger and bigger and moved to different places, I think it lost a lot of its, um, a lot of its point. It was initially more about people. It became about pageantry. Um, more in those productions at the Met, and I wish they'd replace them. Um, as as much as I enjoyed them once upon a time, I always feel that the Met oh, uh, uh, overcasts in those operas. I think the last year, the last season, we had um, uh, Ying Fang and Kate Lindsay, and beautiful was it Manfred Honeck who conducted it? Yes. Was, it was oh my god it's so beautiful and finally i felt it was that finally that production received its due and it had a kind of and michael spires mm -hmm. he was so That's wonderful beautiful last 20 30 minutes he really brought the opera home very moving and they were able with their precision of their playing to capture some of the magical moments that jean-pierre had originally created but which hadn't been played in such a precise and feeling way forever. So I felt like finally that production had got its good cast, its right cast. Well, it leads to the important issue of when a producer, in this case, Pinnell, does the original production and builds it and works on the original performers, including Tatiana Troianos, in a way that they find meaning and understanding, and Troyanos was magnificent. Yeah. When it when you do photocopies of photocopies of original productions with less rehearsal time, you lose a lot of the power. Yeah, but um, I mean, I can't tell you how many times I've seen the Cenerentola that the Ponell did in Ponell, yeah. in a hundred different places, and it 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 continues to lose its its, its purity. The yeah. first performance at the Met of the L'Italiana that he did, L'Italiana in Algeria, was something so exquisite, yeah. so beautifully put together. Just it was like a jewel, um, but it got messier and you know uh, broader, broader. Um, now, given that we've established a lot about you, your taste, your perspective, and so on, and there's so much more we could go to. My next and perhaps final question is, you also teach. And I, I've seen many of your productions with students. I've seen many of your students go on to do great things as performers. 
what if you find you have in front of you a student who may have a glorious voice, looks good, moves well on the stage, but does not have the taste that I referred to originally, or is not well read, or does not have the emotional development or the personal connection to tragedy, or any of these things that a 25-year-old young artist may not yet have and may never develop, especially if they're a tenor, yeah. that... Because oh, I don't. I don't think that's fair. I'm not knocking tenors, but my <laughs> my reason on this, tenors are often not required to develop them because they're hired as tenors. Whereas I, I, I definitely. I mean, I'm a nice man, but I'm also quite firm, and I'm. I require people to uh, encounter themselves, and you know, the training that we do at Juilliard in the this uh, so-called AD program, so artist diploma, is a uh, an intensive two-year acting course, and it's very demanding um, in terms of you know we're, you're in class every day, um, and it's not it's not principally about singing, although the program is also all that and more because it's a Juilliard, and you of course it's about singing, but we try to uh, invite people in who we think in two years we can deliver to, into the business at a at a fairly high level. Mm -hmm. Or at least at a level that is, or at a in a in a placement that makes sense to them and what they how they're envisioning their life. So you know, most of the kids uh, we send to Europe because that's where they can work all the time, yeah. and I want them to be working all the time. I don't want them to sit around in a New York apartment they can't afford and do the odd job when they might be in a theater able to go in and sing the third lady one night and then air to another night and trade off small and large parts and have that wonderful experience and 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 uh, sort of steep themselves in the cultures and the languages of of the pieces that they work on um but we also have some kids who want to stay in america you know they have elderly parents, or they just feel more comfortable here, or they can guest a little bit in Europe. And, and things work out differently depending on what they want for their lives. And I would say that the point of our program is, you know, it's definitely about acting and, and training. And I taught at the Met also for, I don't know, 30 some odd years. Um, so when I mentioned Ying and Kate, um, I do enjoy going to see them. I worked with both of them very closely when they were at, at uh, Juilliard and Lindemann. Uh, Kate didn't go to Juilliard, but Ying went to both. Um, and Paul Appleby, you know, these are people that I uh, that I worked and I learned so much from all of them too about teaching, but also about possibilities for character. Uh, teaching helps me be always less and less reductive about character and what the possibilities are. You know, there's no certain way that a character has to be. Um, but when I now go around and I see these people working, it, it's, a, it's a fantastic um, awe feeling for me. Just mm -hmm. a kind of re a much needed relief at the end of a long career. I mean, I never thought it would be this long. I never thought I'd be this old. None of it. But um, here we are. <laughs> As they say in a French opera, il faut partir, hélas. It's, I have a time constraint today more than you do, and I apologize. I hope that we can sit down in front of a live audience in New York. Um, I teach at NYU, and you are my welcome guest anytime. Uh, well, I love I love it. It's, it's great to talk to you, and I so appreciate your... Um, but just a asking the important questions, it's, it's huge. Well, I meant it when I said that your work has inspired me for a very long time, and you and I have never conversed until today. Mm -hmm. So I feel that there's so much more I want to ask you. To listeners, I commend the work of Stephen Wadsworth, wherever you find him, juilliard.edu, for upcoming productions there. Look for productions all around the world of his work. Look for his translations. Look for his libretti, which we didn't even get to. Really? Um, he's a librettist as well. And Stephen, thank you. So we didn't even talk about directing masterclass. Uh, Terrence we didn't McNally, talk about Collins. Did we? Oh, we, we didn't did. talk about Collins. We didn't talk about Tyne Daly. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> doing Greek tragedy. We didn't talk about Leonard Bernstein. Collins. 
Um, How did we get through an interview and not talk about Leonard Bernstein? Well, well, because I had Jamie Bernstein on recently, and and but yes, we can talk about Leonard Bernstein, who trained me. So I think that would be a wonderful place to continue. Stephen, thank you so much. It's been. I'm going to call this in a moose bouche, and then we'll go for the pasta in the Italian class, and then we'll you. Right. Okay. Anyway, thank you so much. Thank you. It was great. Fun.